so much for joining me today. If you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button and stay a while. If you've been with me a while, thank you so much. Don't be shy. I love hearing you guys' comments and input and all that you have to say. I've had multiple requests for this. I've hesitated to do this video because I don't really consider myself an expert at driving in winter. However, I have driven over 20 years in winter conditions and I haven't had an accident yet. <laughs> Knock on wood. So with that, we're gonna go forward. I'm gonna give you a few tips and tricks and hopefully that will get you on your way. And if you do find anything in here helpful or useful, please do give a big thumbs up. We're gonna go through four items and then I do have a fifth bonus item. And you guys, I'm sorry, typically in my videos, I like to do a lot of B-roll so that you can see what I'm talking about as I'm talking and it's not just me talking at you the whole time. I do not have B-roll for this because it's not winter here yet. And we did have a winter storm a week and a half ago, but at that time, I didn't know I was gonna do this video. All the requests came in after that. But anyways, I'm sorry, you just get to see my face the whole time and we'll go with that. So the very first thing is your equipment. And I did mention this in my Don't Move to Montana If video. You definitely need an all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive vehicle. That vehicle needs to have the ability to downshift, also known as semi-automatic transmission. Driving around here in Flathead County, Big Mountain Road that goes up to Whitefish Ski Resort, that's a great road to practice on in summer. It has a steep enough grade and enough sharp turns for you to really get a feel for it and uh, get good at using the downshifting capabilities. And additionally, you're going to want to probably have snow tires put on that vehicle for winter. That's what many people around here do. We don't. We just have all weather tires and we keep them on year round. If you live in the city, that's probably all you need. If you live out further out in the country, you're going to want to have them put studs on your tires and or get um, snow chains and learn how to put those on your tires. And then something that we have not experienced until this year, actually <laughs> last weekend driving to Helena in our winter storm in October, which by the way is unusual. We don't normally get that. Uh, we might get a few flurries in October, but not this year. Helena got about 18 inches of snow the weekend we were there. And our windshield wipers <laughs> were not working well at all. It was super unsafe. By the end of our, our trip, we had to stop about every five or 10 miles along the side of the road. Um, the nice thing about Montana is there are a lot of pullouts. However, it didn't seem very safe with slick roads to be stopped on the edge of the road out of your car trying to slap windshield wipers. So definitely invest in a good pair of all-weather windshield wipers. All right, so you're like, okay, I've got my equipment. That's number one, check. Number two and three, braking and speed. And I'm going to talk about these somewhat together because they kind of go together. So we're gonna start with braking. Uh, as far as braking is concerned, <laughs> in snow and ice, it's not highly recommended. However, we can't drive without braking. So what do we do? So we just brake a lot sooner and a lot smoother than you would on dry road conditions. What my husband does and has taught us to do, I think it's a great idea. When you're leaving your subdivision, when there's no people behind you and no people around you and you have enough space, do a brake check. So you're gonna be going 20, 25 miles an hour and just slam on those brakes and see what they do. That gives you a great idea of what you're working with as you head out onto the roads that day. Then as far as driving, you're just gonna start braking sooner than you normally would and a bit smoother than you normally would. Now, the second one is speed. So for speed, obviously you're gonna be driving slower than you normally would. If you're not sure how fast to drive, uh, pay attention to the cars around you. The majority is going to be going a speed and that's probably the speed you wanna go as well. There will always be somebody going faster and somebody going slower than that speed. Based on your equipment and your level of experience, you would probably join one of those other groups. If you are very new, you might wanna go a little slower. If you don't have a four wheel drive or some of those other equipment pieces I talked about, you might find yourself going slower. If you do find yourself going slower, no problem, just get over into the slower lane, please, so we can pass you if you are on a road where it's just a single lane road in the country and you're going a lot slower and you start seeing cars pile up behind you, the polite and safer thing to do is to pull off at the next pullout, let those cars go by. They will appreciate that greatly and it will be better for you because you won't feel pressured with them jamming up behind you. Where speed and braking kind of meet 
and this is the condition you really don't look forward to, but it happens. So in winter conditions, you need to allow more time for pulling out in front of people and for turning left in front of people. If you're driving and somebody turns left in front of you and they haven't allowed that extra time, it's really frustrating because that puts you in a situation where you run into them or you have to slam on your brakes in the snowy conditions. And that's when you're going to hear that anti-lock braking system hopefully doing its job and it's gonna kind of stutter you to a stop. However, <laughs> that should only come about in emergencies like that. All right, so look at us go. We've already done number one, two, and three. Number four is an emergency bag, having an emergency bag in your vehicle. If you're just doing city driving, you really don't need this. You're gonna have cell service, there's gonna be people around. However, if you are driving in Montana from any big city to another big city, you're going to have dead spots on your cell service. You're going to most likely be crossing a pass of some sort, which is more dangerous. And then you're also going to probably be on some wide open roads where drifting and blowing and that sort of thing can happen. So you definitely want to have an emergency bag packed for you or your children if they're going off to college in a different city. So what's in an emergency bag? That's a great question. My husband has packed ours, so I'm going to go get that. <laughs> We're going to go through it and see what you should pack. All right, so this is our emergency bag that is in our vehicle for any road trips that we take. Honestly, we just pretty much leave it in there all the time. And basically this bag is to survive for 24 hours in the cold. If you were to slide off into a ditch, not have cell service, not have anybody around to find you. So in the biggest pocket of this bag is a wool blanket that's folded up nicely, fits right in there and an ax and I asked my husband what this is for. He said, so that if you need to, you can go chop down some wood and start yourself a fire. So in addition to the ax, he has also put a couple fire starters in here and then also the flint and steel. Obviously in the middle of snow, that's going to be very difficult. You're gonna have to find the wood. You have to chop the sides, the wet sides of the wet wood off, reach the inner wood and that should be dry. And of course you're going to have to make a spot in the snow to be able to do that. So it's definitely not going to be easy, but you should be able to survive. And additionally in there, a lot of hand warmers, foot warmers, a knife in there as well, and also a couple emergency miler blankets. And then additionally, he has some <laughs> very disgusting, I'm sure, uh, energy bars, survival bars. Each one is 400 calories. And then of course, gloves and some type of beanie or hat or something. Now, this road trip bag is assuming that you already have a coat, something warm, probably additional clothes if you're going on a road trip. So you should have plenty of opportunity to add layers as needed as well. The ax, my husband said, you can also use to bust out a window if you needed to. If there was an accident or something, you can open the doors. And then also the knife and the ax and the wool blanket, he said you could uh, cut strips to tie around a wound or something if you needed to tourniquet that as well. And that's all we have. I would say we should probably maybe add a first aid kit. He might already have that in the glove box in the car. If you have an emergency bag and you feel like we've missed something, leave a comment below for everybody. Let them know, let me know, and I will get that added here. And then also in the blog post, there is a blog post with all of this information. So if I've gone too fast, or if you wanna reference the information for later, Click the link in the description below. That will take you to my blog post with all of this detailed out for you. All right, so those are our four things to be aware of. You get those four things down and you're pretty good to go. So we have equipment, we have speed, we have braking, and then we have our emergency bag for road trips. Now, the bonus item, something else that I've seen in the comments from people in Montana particularly, are comments about plugging your vehicle in in winter, about not locking your doors, and about leaving your vehicle running. I have not had to do any of this personally. However, I did look this stuff up <laughs> because I was curious what they were talking about. So if it gets down below negative 13 degrees, you're really not supposed to start your car like that just right off the bat. It may not start. Some even say below five degrees. Typically it doesn't get that cold here. And remember, if your car is in the garage, your garage is probably taking it about 20 degrees higher than the outdoor temperature. Since living here at Flathead County, the coldest that I've seen it is about negative six. So it's never been a problem for us. However, some areas in Montana get a whole lot colder. 
In that situation, I was very confused because people say you have to plug in your car. It's not your car that you're plugging in. <laughs> it's not a hybrid. I told people to get rid of those before coming here. There are three different things you could be plugging in. So one is a battery blanket, and that kind of goes around your battery, keeps it warm, and helps it start easier in the cold. An oil pan heater, and that heats underneath the oil pan and warms up that oil, and that also helps with starting it and warming it up faster. And then there are black heaters. Those, uh, as far as I could tell by reading, typically come factory installed. However, those don't really help with the starting of the vehicle, but they will help it warm up faster once it's started. You can buy timers. You'd want to get an extension cord, it sounds like, and a timer to put them on. Sounds like four hours is the optimum time to have it plugged in. And this is highly recommended if you are in a colder part of Montana or maybe have an older vehicle or maybe don't have a garage to put that vehicle in. The second item that people have mentioned is not locking a car door because the locks can freeze in winter. I've never experienced this either. However, researching if that does happen to you, well, one, a preventative measure that I read was to use like a spray lubricant before winter hits, like WD-40, get that down in there, and that should hopefully prevent that from happening if it does still happen. I read that you do not, you do not want to put hot water on it. While that may work immediately, it can break down the locking system in there, and that's not going to be a good long-term idea. I did read, interesting, Something that a lot of us have on hand, especially this year in 2020, is hand sanitizer. And the ingredients in hand sanitizer can lower the freezing point of water, so it can actually help you get in if your lock is stuck. You want to be very gentle, coat your key in that, gently kind of wiggle it in until it gets in there. Don't push anything, you don't want to break your key off in there. Once you do get it in, leave it in for about 30 seconds let that work and then try to turn it and see if that works. I don't know if this is really a problem with the remote keyless entry thing. I did read that if it does freeze up, if one does freeze up with that, usually it's just one side of the car, whichever one was receiving the wind. So hopefully you could still get in the other side of your car. But again, this is not something I've dealt with, but if you have and you have any other recommendations or advice, leave that in the comments below as well. And then the last thing that I've heard people say is leave your car running because it may not start back up. A quick Google search on that one said that was a really bad idea, both for your car and for the environment. But anyway, if you have input on that, leave it below as well. Don't forget to hit that notification bell so you get notified when the next video drops. If you have any other ideas for videos that you would like me to create, shoot me a message. I'll be happy to look into that. And also, you guys are free to private message me at any point. So in the comments, sometimes people will ask more detailed questions. Usually I'm going to tell you to private message me and so we can take that off of the comment area and I can get a little more personal with you. So definitely you can message me through my Facebook page or my Instagram page. Otherwise, you can private message me through my website. Just hit the little contact tab and I will get that and I will respond to you guys. Have an awesome week. I hope that was helpful and I'll see you next time.